All righty, we are fortunate today to have Dr. Mike, the prehab guys with us today to talk about the knee. And I'll have to say, Mike, you're my favorite. I like you the best. I don't know what it is, but there's just something about you. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, when it comes to the knee, and you know, this is one of your areas of expertise, and you, know, you guys' app is amazing. We'll talk about that here in a second. But I wanted to just start with just kind of getting into ACL knee injuries with specific to a couple of clients that we have and a couple of trainers. Yeah. And go into pain and then just kind of have a conversation and go from there. Love it, Chris. Appreciate you having me on. Love talking about knees. It's by far my favorite body region. Um, over the years, as my my clinical like hours have decreased, I basically only see lower extremity. Like I just only see knees. I, anything in that shoulder, like no, nope, Garage can see them. Someone else can see them. Basically, lower extremity. That's my wheelhouse. Um, I think it's my wheelhouse from what I like to see clinically, but it's also what I like training. I just have a lot more fun training lower extremity than upper extremity. So. Um, happy to have a conversation and, and hope to provide as much value as I can to your audience. Yeah. So with the ACL anterior cruciate ligaments, and if you were to hear that nasty pop and, you know, you were to have to get an ACL surgery. So what, what's going on there? So, you know, you hear people talking about cadaver, you hear people talking about their own, you know, what, what is the process that we are seeing today and the recovery rehab aspect, because you, especially like with sports, you'll hear, well, this athlete's going to be coming back nine months from a torn ACL. And I, I know I've talked to like Dr. Waterbury, and like, Ooh, that's, that's kind of aggressive. Right. And so just kind of want to educate the listeners on what's going on with an ACL tear and then get into some of the stuff afterwards. Oh yeah. I guess we, we can, we can start, I guess, maybe a big picture. So the ACL is a ligament ligaments um, attached from bones to bone, and they basically hold bones together passively. So it's our passive check from a bone going through too much range of motion quote unquote active check would be like maybe like the muscles around around that joint so it's preventing your tibia your lower leg bone from going too far usually forward and a little bit of into uh, internal rotation away from the femur we have ligaments all across the body they're doing this all the time we don't necessarily feel them uh, we don't have uh, receptors in the net we're feeling something stretched like that so this is all happening extremely quick our nervous system uh, is really not even responding. When we have an ACL tear, there, there's studies where the nervous system hasn't even really uh, recognized that it's torn yet before it has a muscular response, which is our active system, basically trying to prevent the bones from moving too far. So ACL tears are extremely, extremely common, especially in youth athletes, especially in females. There's a lot of predisposing factors that go into it. Um, and now where a lot of the conversation is going is, well, how do we, how can we prevent them as best we can? And how can we rehab them better? Um, the risk of suffering from a second ACL injury, if you've already had one is one in four, that's pretty horrible. So if you have a, an athlete that you're training and they had an ACL injury four years ago, there's a one in four chance that they will have another ACL injury. And it doesn't necessarily uh, mean it's on the same knee. So if they injured their left ACL, it's actually more common to injure your contralateral side or your right side. And the reason that's the case is that when we rehab these ACLs, we'll go to this example, the left one, we have an incomplete rehab process, meaning the person never actually gets back to 100%. They get back to 80%, 85%, 90%. They feel fine. They think they're moving fine. But if we actually put them through a battery of tests or we look at their psychological metrics and how confident they are with certain tasks, they actually end up moving differently on that ACL side, that left side. So they don't want to put as much force through that ACL side, the left side, and they ended up breaking and decelerating more on their quote unquote good healthy side, which is the right side. So now the right side is more susceptible to higher loads. Um, so that's where we are falling and we as in the rehab community are falling wrong is that you have a one in four chance of re-injuring yourself because we're not doing a good enough job getting that person back in the first place. And then it's this vicious cycle. Then they get another ACL surgery and another one. And then it's really, really tough. That's so crazy because our instructor in, in San Diego, Megan, uh, played for international uh, FIFA and blew out her left and then right. And then she just blew out her left again. <laughs> yeah. And that's crazy. And so like now she's uh, in a cast and she's, you know, crutches and saying she's like a month out. And so, you know, just kind of take us through as a trainer, if you were to have someone, obviously you're not going to be doing anything with uh, when you, anyone until probably what, six months, you may be able to start seeing them or when would trainers be able to start working with 
an athlete or someone who had an ACL tear because they're going to be with the PT for that, you know, period of time. Honestly, if a trainer or a strength coach works really, really closely with the PT, I don't honestly feel like that can happen within the two to three month range. Um, by the two, if it's a non-complicated ACL, meaning it's just an ACL tear, there's no meniscus involvement in terms of like a meniscus repair. There's no posterior, posterior lateral like injuries. It's clean and say it's a, a allograph. So an allograph means that they took tissue from a cadaver versus an autograph, meaning they took tissue from the, the, the own, the own person usually it's like a hamstring quad tendon, patellar tendon. So on the most, the least, con, the least, most conservative one, meaning an allograph they're really clean. Um, by about two months out, hopefully the PT has done their job. They got basically full range of motion. They're walking, their gait's fine. And from that two to six month mark, it just looks like a really good strength training program. Um, and that's where I, I really do feel coaches, trainers can work well with PTs because like in our model, for example, we're in a cash-based out of network model cost 250 plus to see us. I would, uh, that's, that's not worth it in my opinion. For someone to spend that money twice a week just to go through the same squat, which they're going to have to do for four months. Of course, we're going to vary the load and a lot of other things when it comes to programming, but they don't necessarily uh, need to pay that much money to just get strong because that, that's basically the goal in that three to six month mark is get really, really strong. Um, but you also have to have experience working with people with, with those orthopedic conditions and with those injuries. Um, and that's where working hand in hand with someone, an allied health professional, I think could be a really good team. I love that because that's one of the things we talk about in class is networking with medical professionals and trainers, I think are incompetent and in, in the sense that they don't have the capacity to have a conversation with you in the sense, like you're talking about, you know, tibia, anterior glide, ACL, and the trainer's like, where's your ACL again? I think as the, the medical professional, if you heard someone say that, they'd be like, oh, I don't know if I want my client to, to go work with this trainer. And so, you know, what would you, would there be any main contraindications at like that six month marker that the trainer shouldn't be doing? I mean, obviously, like you said, you got to be involved with the therapist, ideally maybe shadow a couple of sessions, but would there be any, you know, contraindications? There could be, a, I guess, a lot of, say, say everything is going smooth in the rehab process, meaning there are, there are no medical uh, contraindications at that point. The biggest thing and the hardest thing when working with ACL, any any lower limb injury that has a long recovery time frame like an ACL, especially if you've had a second injury, so like the trainer that you mentioned, is that you start developing poor movement patterns. And it's really, 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 really hard to train out of once someone develops it. That's why when someone has a second ACL tear, it's much harder than treating the first one because they likely already developed poor movement patterns from the first one. So at that six month mark, likely someone's quad is not at 90% yet, just in when it comes to iso, uh, isometric or uh, isokinetic testing. So the quad is king when it comes to like any sort of knee rehab. If someone's quad is not as strong as their other side, they will naturally be favoring it and shifting their weight in different ways to avoid loading that limb. And may, you may not see it in a, you know, a, um, a task that is like as simple as walking or squatting without a lot of weight, but the moment you add speed and more load to it, you will see compensations where they will shift to their other limb or they will shift weight away from their knee and they'll try to put it on their hip or their ankle. So unless as a trainer, you are able to see those things and be aware of those compensations, you may be building them up in their strength and their squats and their lunges, the Bulgarians and their weight may be going up, but they're actually getting stronger in all the other regions, not necessarily in their quad. And then now they're re- developing the poor movement had habits that actually predispose them to a higher risk of injury later. And it's not just trainers, it's PTs too. Uh, that, that, that's where it goes wrong. It's like, oh, I see all their numbers are going up. They're getting stronger. I see them doing more and they feel stronger. Yeah, but they're moving differently. And that's why they feel stronger. That's the importance of the movement competency aspect. You know, you need, you need to be able to see what is truly right. And I love that because that's fascinating. You could have a client three years post ACL and if you don't do an assessment to learn about that and really break down their movement patterns, then you, know, you could be loading them up and they, they feel fine because it's three years post, but you know, there, it can almost be like a ticking time bomb. Yeah. I, I guarantee like anyone to, 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 to almost every ACL, I, I honestly feel like is not fully, fully rehabbed. Um, if you have a client that's like, yeah, I went to ACL. Did you ever get back to your sport? 
guarantee the majority of them said more majority of them will say no or if they say yes you say you ask what well, do you feel exactly the same did you get back to the exact same level of competition they will say no and those people that say no that means 100 percent they are moving differently 100 percent. which is a perfect segue into how we could use your guys's app for you know you have a client that comes in and you guys will love the story because one of our show fitness cpts got a job at a really high-end gym in sacramento reached out to me. He said, Chris, I got a client coming in, has some knee pain. What do I do? I've never worked with knee pain. I said, get the app, <laughs> get the prehab guys app. He said, he downloaded it like that moment, 15 minutes prior to the assessment. Cause he was just notified, went through some of the exercises, showed the client, signed him up for a $3,000 package. <laughs> and I think that's really great because if, you know, for trainers that are listening, a client is sometimes they can be a little pushy and bossy and be like, well, you know, I had knee surgery five years ago. It's not a big deal. But you heard Dr. Mike tell you right now that it's like, no, it is a big deal. And, you know, part of their warm up, and, and as we incorporate with our programming, our, our CCA, you know, your accessory, that would be a great time to put in a, a prehab exercise. And so, what would be some of those, you know, for those that don't have the app, what would be some, you know, really great go to exercises? I know I've talked to Chad before, and he's a big believer in just like the side clam and, you know, using like one of the, what are those little bands called? They're not, their yeah, like, bands or like the hip halos yeah like the just like the the latex ones that are really you know they're not like the, the typical booty bands but mm -hmm. the theraband yeah it's a theraband okay so the, the theraband and, and he'd say you know try to hold for 30 or 60 seconds you know what are some suggestions for those prehab exercises that would be good for clients that experience some type of post acl stuff it's a hard question because uh, it really depends on what the person's impairments are. But say we wanted to build a couple of exercises that hit some of the common, most common impairments and risk factors that we know for sustaining just knee injuries in general, we can start from the bottom. Um, first thing at, at the foot and ankle, ankle, ankle mobility, they need to have good dorsiflexion. Um, if you don't have good dorsiflexion and you're asking someone to go into certain positions, whether it's a squat, whether it's a lunge, any, any position that they will shift away from that because they don't have that range there. If you don't have good ankle dorsiflexion, you're not a, actually able to load your knee. So if you try to go to the bottom of a lunge and your knee doesn't translate forward over your toes, maybe it just gets to your toes, but it doesn't really go past that. The only way for you to continue to descend in your lunge is you have to shift into your hip. So now again, we're, we're doing an exercise like a lunge that looks great. It, it feels good. We're getting the person stronger, but they're actually just getting their hip a lot stronger. They're not getting their knee stronger. So when it comes to kind of trying to build a program, I always want to, make, want to make sure mobility is cleared out first because I could be doing the right strengthening exercises, but they don't have the capacity to get in the positions that we're not actually strengthening the right things. So uh, ankle dorsiflexion is the first one. Say that's cleared. Then the two areas that we want to focus on is calf strength and then quad strength. I know glute strength is a, is a big one too, but almost everyone has strong glutes now just from society, from cultural um, from it's popular it's very popular to train your glutes so it's not i feel like maybe a, it's not something that a lot of people are lacking and people kind of already know oh i should be doing these exercises so the two areas that i'll focus on are the calf and the quad um so calf strength extremely important when you decelerate which is where people tear their acls the two main muscle groups that are responsible for decelerating you are first your quad second your calf both of those muscles control your tibia, which is that lower bone translating forward over your knees eccentrically. So you need strength in both of those two. So any sort of calf work that you'd want to do, we keep it simple, like a calf raise, any sort of knee work it could be a knee extension. It could be a Bulgarian, just something where the knee is essentially translating over the toes. And so when to take a step back, you were talking about dorsiflexion. Is there a degree that we're going for like 20 degrees or are we talking about a knee to the wall with our toes like four inches from the wall like, like a like a knee to a wall yeah yeah and just making sure that it's similar some people may be stiffer than others but say it's two inches on both sides maybe they have room to improve both but that's not as glaring as a concern of two on one side and four on the other gotcha gotcha so uh, calf and quad strength really really important i like that and so you know, that's going to be helping the clients with the rehab prehab stuff now what if someone didn't have and a surgery because I've only, I mean, I've talked to people and they'll, 
it's always like a he said, she said, where one of my clients said that, well, I went to the doctor and they said, I don't even need to get an ACL repair. I'm just going to, you know, just rehab it myself. And so yeah. you, know, you have a client that comes in, maybe they chose not to get surgery or maybe just they don't have the insurance. And so would that, everything that we're discussing right now still be the same? Yeah. Same apply. Yeah. Cause for that person that did have that, that ACL, I guarantee you the quad and the calf is not, not there to the degree that it needs to be. For the person that didn't get surgery, same thing. It's not there. For anyone that had an injury, for both of those examples, someone had an injury, they just decided to to proceed down either an operative or non-operative route. Both people had an injury. I mean, there's an injury there, and there was a likely a period, a, a long period of deloading or un, un, unusing, not using that limb. So we know that that person's capacity has gone down to a certain point. Just doing surgery doesn't bring back that person's capacity or strength. That's the rehab process. That's the training where, where we're going wrong is we're not doing enough of that. So both of those individuals, irrespective of kind of what route they chose, will need will need more quad strength and will need more calf strength. Now, are we talking concentric, eccentric, or do we begin with isometric or where do we like to start? If you're able to do full isotonic, great. Say the person has pain, then maybe you start with just one. Maybe you even back it up more and just start with isometrics. Um, I feel like to get the most bang for your buck, always shoot for more and then assess. And was the client able to handle that? Great. Then I'm just going to stay there rather than saying, I need to start with the smallest and build up. Um, granted, if you're not, if you're concerned, that's a different route, but say, say there's not many concerns. You're like, let's, let's see if they can handle this based on your clinical judgment or what, working with other people. I think they can handle this, but then, oh, how do they feel the next day? Oh, they're a little swollen. Well, well, that was way too much. Let's, let's back that down a little bit mm -hmm. and then reassess. So with now let's push the ACL aside and just go to knee pain in general. I know that's a very complex, uh, topic in general, but if a client were to come in, now here, train a lot of times when you go to an Equinox or a Lifetime, they're going to give you these hypothetical scenarios as the coach to get hired there. So, you know, here's a scenario: thirty-five year old, overweight, they have knee pain. Design a program, and so if you were to have a client in front of you and they had some knee pain, uh, I know that I've been told in the past, like you know, wall sits maybe right above where the pain starts, and then we get into the whole like, well, what type of pain is okay, like. You hear people talk about scales, like, you know, zero is nothing, 10 is terrible. Is that still, you know, some credibility within that? Like, can we talk about a, a pain scale and like, okay, you can do this, get to like a level of four or five, just don't get to a 10. What, what, what are your thoughts around that? I think so. There's no right or there's no like um, black and white rules when it comes to this, but when dealing with pain, we know it's so much more complex than just what's happening. We'll, we'll keep it with the knee or what's happening biomechanically, what's happening at the meniscus. We're, we're dealing with a person who has um, thoughts, who has emotions, who has past experiences. Someone may have just absolutely hated a wall sit and that's where they thought they got hurt. So they can't do a wall sit, barely pushing into the wall, but they can squat 350, you know, like, so the nervous system and what our, what our previous experiences are and what what we have learned and what we've drawn connections are because we're all each our own human beings that 100 percent affects how we each feel and respond to pain um so that's where it's, it's never like a black and white right answer that we can apply across the board um, but essentially if we're working and training with people in pain we don't want to completely go away from it um, because if we completely go away from it we're not now exposing that person's nervous system and their brain to a stimulus that they're probably going to um, they're probably going to run into in day-to-day -day life because they go up and down stairs or they try to pick up their kid. You know, they have to live a life. So our job is to expose them to a stimulus that their nervous system says it's okay. And that's where the pain modeling, like what number of pain is okay. For someone, it could be one out of two. For another person, it could be five out of 10. It's it's all about seeing how do they respond to what you did the next day. And if the response was was good, there was no swelling, their pain maybe it was only during the exercise and it didn't didn't last later in the day. They were able to sleep. I think that whatever was chosen was a good level of stimulus. Um, and that's where it's hard. It's really hard. It's in case by case dependent. Yeah, and obviously you have quite the the background in this. And so for for new trainers that are listening, you know, don't jump right in there and try to fix your clients. And you know, that's an opportunity to intern or learn under some therapist. And as Mike was saying, reach out to them and build that network. And so you said something about inflammation. I know that I've gotten texts before with clients and they'll say, well, my knee's a little inflamed. And you're like, oh crap, did I hurt them? But you know, it's, it's not normal, but it's like, they're okay. They're going to, they'll be okay. But where are we at now with the whole 
inflammation and and I know the whole rice thing back in the you know, 90s was big but now we've kind of gone away from that and even the doctor who invented it, I think Dr. Merkin he, he kind of went back on what he was saying with ice so what are the suggestions now when it comes to swelling so when it comes to swelling basically um, compression elevation try not to take uh, anti-inflammatories typically not trying to take uh, not trying to ice um, that will help with the pain it's not going to necessarily do anything physiologically to the injury, quote unquote, the injury that's there. But I would say a lot of times when we're training with people, they're not necessarily having an acute injury unless we did something horribly wrong. We've had them jump off a box, you know, they had an acute injury. Typically they, that pain just kind of developed throughout the training session. And now they're letting us know the next day, yo, yo, that was a little bit too much. And when it comes to that, it's really hard to say. And I would, I would argue a lot of times it's not inflammation that we're dealing with there. We're just dealing with either their nervous system or maybe a tendinopathy or, or something else in their in their body that's saying whatever we did yesterday was too much. Um, the the you know um, traumatic injury when we have when we do when we know there's inflammation because that's how the body responds. That's a different um, treatment approach or how we how we would respond to that than just. Uh, we added too much load to the system. The, the system didn't have the capacity to do that training session that we did with that client that day. Um, and that's where it, 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 they are definitely different management systems. We have to be a lot more cautious with that acute injury. Um, okay, we need to protect it a little bit, see how it's going to respond. We can't just go into the the mindset that I went to. Let's just see what level of pain it is. That would be more for a training client where I don't think they had an acute injury. I just, they clearly are sensitive from what I did the other day. Let's play with some things. And it's a little bit, I don't call it more aggressive, but we just have to be a lot more cautious with that acute injury than with the more training sensitivity uh, that a client will tell us. And okay, that's great. So I like that. Now we have some parameters on acute, more chronic. We were talking before and you said something really interesting about ACLs and how, because you were talking about the nervous system. And so in actuality, if a repair, it's stronger. Can you talk to us a little bit more about what you're saying? Yeah. That? Was yeah so, so when they so when they reconstruct so the ACL is a ligament when someone tears it, um, typically the main option right now is, is a reconstruction. So they take cadaver or your own tendon and they basically reconstruct that that ligament. There's also the differences. There's also repairs which they're starting to do more now, where they actually don't reconstruct the ligament. They take your existing ligament that had broken. They actually repair it. Typically, the where I'm seeing the the highest um, success rates is usually kids. A lot of times when they tear their ACLs, the ACL is actually still intact. The bone where the ACL attached just comes off. So they're just attaching the bone back. Or if it's a clean break in the middle of the ACL, they do some sort of, I'm not an orthopedic surgeon, but they, they do something there and they put some sort of cascade there that allows it to, to heal. But all the research, most of the research is on reconstructions and that's what's most common. And again, reconstructions is when we take a different tissue and we try to rebuild the ACL. In cadav cadaveric models where they do this, the ACL is significantly stronger than our physiologic ACL, meaning our, our normal ACL. So what the ACL, ACL does is it, it checks how much anterior shear, like the tibia, can go forward on the femur. And when they do this in a ca cadaver, when they do a reconstruction, it is significantly stronger than what our native ACL can do. But the moment you put that in the human body, there's a lot of other factors that go into well, is that ACL actually going to be as strong? First of all, your, your body has to accept the tissue, whether it's your own or whether someone else's. And then you also have to have the muscular strength to prevent a lot of that load from going directly on the ACL and move and work on your movement patterns because that ACL is stronger, like 100%. All of these surgeries, you talk about UCL surgeries, the reconstructed ligament, if you just did the biomechanical studies, it's stronger than what we natively have. Um, significantly, significantly, significantly stronger. Um, but we still retear them because we're exposing them to a lot more loads and our body's not able to handle those loads. So it just all goes to the ligament and then bam, we have a tear, another tear. That's crazy. So that's, that's so fascinating just how the body, the organism outside of the, the nervous system is one thing. And then the nervous system together, it's a whole nother phenomenon. Yeah. It's yeah. It's every everything. Yeah, it's 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 crazy. The anatomy is fun, uh, and it, and it's a lot easier for us to comprehend. Um, 
but then the more and more we're learning is that, yeah, that's just the end result. The nervous system is what's controlling all that. And that's a lot harder to understand and comprehend. So I know that you're not practicing as much because your guys' business is growing through the roof. And if you guys have not checked out their app, it's a, it's a must get. Now for, for regular listeners, if you're just a gen pop, the app's great. But if you're an actual trainer, we have a special deal with the pre guys. You get the app, but also the exercise library. So that's not offered anywhere else. So just make sure to reach out to me and we'll connect you with that deal. Both are phenomenal. I mean, I know you guys filmed a lot at our spot in Santa Monica and your library now with recently you went to the, I don't know which gym you went to, but you got a bunch of machine videos now. So you're probably closer to 4,000 videos, right? I would say, yeah, it's kind of crazy uh, over the lifetime. Um, a lot of those videos, we look like kids. <laughs> but that's, that's growth right there. So, you know, super proud of you guys. And I'll have a couple uh, business questions for trainers. And so I'm a big advocate in having a great team. And we've been fortunate to be able to be connected through Chad and I met you guys and you've been awesome. And, you know, for trainers that are listening, if you were to reach out to a therapist, what would be some pointers, whether if it's social media or emailing them to maybe shadow a session or intern for a week or just take you out to lunch or dinner? What would be some pointers or something that you'd like to see? I, I, I don't know about you, but I hate it when people ask me like, hey, can I pick your brain for 20 minutes for free? Mm -hmm. like, I'm not saying I'm above you. I want to give back, but it almost sounds like, give me, give me, give me. I don't care about you. I want it just about me. So what would be some pointers that you have? I think the easiest way to foster that relationship is to be authentically interested in something. Um, a lot of, and, and a lot of the times, because as a trainer, you're working with the client that is likely in pain. And that's maybe why you're reaching out is maybe shadowing and work, working with that client. Cause you care about that client. You're, you're, you're clearly trying to, the client has other fitness goals that they're trying to get back to. And maybe it's being impeded or slowed down because of pain or injury. And that's where you're like, I think it'd be great to connect with the PT. Maybe that person's in PT. So just connecting with that therapist and saying, Hey, we share this client, you know, Jim, um, we're having issues. We'd love to know, you know, what you, what you guys are doing to address it. Maybe what I can do in the programming to, to facilitate, you know, uh, the best overall program, because in PT, we have a program, there's a program too. And the PT needs to know that they're also doing other stuff outside of there because the PT may be running up a program that the loads, they're like, oh, this is a great amount of load for a week. And then they're like, oh shit, they're doing all this other stuff. So I need it. The PT needs to change their, their program, or maybe it's vice versa, but it should be a collaborative process trying to figure out what that client is doing all seven days of the week, not just the one day or two days a week. They're with me, the PT or with, with the client or with the trainer. Love it. That's great. Great piece of advice right there. So I just wanted to end off on a Q and a real quickly. Just one question that I put on our social media and some questions and, you know, because your guys' following has grown so large, you guys are over a million and we had a nice little celebration at your Culver City spot. That was great. Uh, had some expensive whiskey with Craig, I think. And uh, <laughs> But what would be some pointers for uh, trainers, therapists, strength coaches to grow their social media? Hmm. I would say, um, I would say understand why you're doing it. Um, I think Understanding who your audience is, is, is really important um, in terms of is my audience and is the reason why I'm doing it to connect with other professionals like myself and to network, or is it to connect with a different audience? Um, so I think a lot of times we think we're trying to maybe connect with a different audience, but maybe rather it's just an outlet to connect with, with our, with our own, with our own audience, with our own professionals, with, with colleagues um, and, and it's different because then the type of information you're putting out would be a little bit different if it's geared towards more, I guess we can call it the end consumer versus it's geared towards um, other trainers and professionals. Um, I know that's something that we've gone, we've had to make adjustments to, uh, throughout the years. Um, but yeah, just understanding why you're putting out content and then the content should match that. I think the why is really, really important. You guys have so many resources, your website and your you're still the prehab guys on the website or so where can people find you? Uh, so they can find us at uh, the prehab guys.com or the prehab guys across um, social media channels, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, TikTok. Um, yeah. The, the team is so much more than, 
than just the three of us or just the guys. And unfortunately, all the other handles were taken. And that's just the name that that is recognized. So we've we've kept that. But the pre ev guys across across social or website would be where to find this website as well. And again, check out their exercise library and their app. Great things to complement your toolbox as a trainer and strength coach. So thank you for your time today, Mike. This was awesome. And looking forward to you know, sharing some some whiskey and wine with you here shortly. Let's do it. Thank you for all you do too. Appreciate it, Chris.